The question whether roof braces can be reliably supported on conventionally framed ceiling joists has surfaced repeatedly in multiple online building forums and spirited job site discussions between seasoned framers. At first glance, it may seem harmless to support a strut on a typical ceiling joist or even a group of ceiling joists joined by a common cross member to distribute the load. The framework resulting from this kind of framing appears to mimic a site-built truss where the brace is a web member and the ceiling joist is a bottom cord. It is possible that a framer supporting the braces on ceiling joists perceives it from that perspective. However, on closer scrutiny, this is by no means a truss and the system often lacks the structural integrity that is demanded by the code and owed to the homeowner. Therefore, it is extremely important for both builders and designers to be thoroughly informed of the code requirements in this regard. Having laid bare the problem, it is important to stress that every brace that lands on a ceiling joists is not a sign of a code-deficient design. As we shall see later, there is a possible approach that may allow this type of framing as one of the options. According to the code, such a design should not be solely determined in the field by the framer without oversight. On the contrary, it should result from detailed and exhaustive structural analysis grounded in accepted principles of structural mechanics under the blessing of a licensed engineer or architect. The question is not a matter of carpentry convenience but of structural integrity and life safety. In this video, we are going to explore the reasons why roof braces or struts should not be supported by ceiling joists in a strict conventional construction framework. We are also going to explore possible solutions that designers can consider. Please note that this video is not intended to describe the fastener requirements between the braces and roof framing members or braces and bearing walls. The International Residential Code uses the term braces to mean vertical or diagonal roof struts supporting compression load from rafters down to the framing below. The code identifies two types of roof braces. First, we have purlin braces which support purlins that support common rafters. Secondly, we have hip and valley braces that support hip and valley rafters. The code requirements for the construction of purlin braces are provided in section R802.4.5. Purlin braces are not an essential element in the construction of a conventional gable roof which means that they are not always required. These braces are only needed where rafters cannot span from the ridge to the wall either due to sizing limits or lack of availability of the required spans. Therefore, an intermediate support which effectively divides the single span into two spans is required. The intermediate support is provided by purlins which are then supported by purlin braces. Let us assume we have a rafter span of 18 feet from ridge to bearing wall and the designer wants to use 2 by 6 grade number 2 Douglas fir rafters spaced at 24 inches on center. We are assuming a dead load of 10 pounds per square foot for composite shingles roofing and a roof live load of 20 pounds per square foot. Based on Table 1 in Section R802.4.1, the allowable span is just under 12 feet. If you are not familiar with how to use the IRC table to size framing members, please check out our video on sizing roof rafters. If you are interested in a deeper and comprehensive training on roof framing, then please check out our exhaustive conventional roof framing course at www.conventionalframing.com. Therefore, we can see that the 2x6 member which has an allowable span of 11 feet and 11 inches is not adequate and should not be used since the required roof span is 18 feet. This is where section R802.4.5 comes in. The code allows the designer to use purlins which are essentially short span beams to support the rafters. Purlins are supported by minimum 2 by 4 braces which are spaced at a maximum spacing of 4 feet on center and installed vertically or at a slope not less than 45 degrees from the horizontal. The code also specifies that the unbraced length of purlin braces should not exceed 8 feet. The purlin line marks the end of one span and the beginning of the other span. This means that the span of the rafters is effectively reduced. If the purlin in our project was installed 10 feet from the exterior bearing wall, 
The rafters will now have a 10-foot span and an 8-foot span which means that the designer can now use the 2x6 rafters spaced at 24 inches on center. While the introduction of the purlin and purlin braces has solved the rafter span problem, the designer now faces a new one. The purlin braces need proper vertical support beneath them that can transfer vertical loads down to the foundations. This is how some designers end up landing those braces on ceiling joists. Before looking at what happens to ceiling joists under this unexpected loading, let us look at braces that are sometimes used to support hip and valley rafters. Section R802.4.3 specifies that hip and valley rafters shall be supported by a brace to a bearing partition or be designed to carry and distribute the specific load at that point. Hip and valley rafters form the backbone of a hip roof, converging where planes meet to define its shape and strength. The geometry of a hip roof is supported primarily by hip rafters which span from the end of the ridge to the building corner at the intersection of load-bearing walls. The hip rafters supports jack rafters which span between the hip rafter and the bearing wall. This means that hip rafters function as beams and must have the required strength and stiffness to support the applied load. Additionally, they must have proper supports with sufficient stiffness and strength. The IRC recognizes the intersection of the hip and ridge as a structural bottleneck where loads cannot simply be transferred arbitrarily to non-bearing members at the ridge. Instead, the code requires a post or a brace that can transfer the reactions to a bearing partition that can safely deliver the load to the foundation. If this load lands on a ceiling joist, the load path that was initially intended to occur through axial compression all the way to the foundation changes to one that relies on the bending strength and stiffness of the ceiling joists. Let us now explore the complexities introduced when purlin braces or hip and valley braces are supported on ceiling joists. Ceiling joists are analyzed and sized to support uniform or lightly concentrated ceiling loads. In conventional framing, they are not sized to support concentrated loads transferred from roof framing by braces and posts. When a purlin brace or hip rafter brace lands on a ceiling joist, the ceiling joists effectively end up supporting both ceiling loads and the roof loads delivered through the brace. The result is a composite loading condition that exceeds the design assumptions used to size the joists which subsequently introduces stresses and deflections far beyond what was anticipated. The undesired outcomes of such loading conditions can manifest in three major ways. First, there is the possibility of instantaneous excessive deflection. This occurs where the joist bends immediately under the added load. This may happen immediately after installation, during roofing and re-roofing, or after a typical snowfall that would otherwise have no observable effect on the roof. Secondly, there is the possibility of excessive long-term deflections. Long-term deflections are the result of sustained dead load which induces creep. Creep is the slow, progressive deformation of wood under a sustained load, where deflection increases over time even if the load remains constant. This means that the problem is not observable immediately after construction but develops continuously under sustained roof load. Eventually, the problem will damage the ceiling and possibly compromise the stability of the entire roof system. Finally, we have failure by overstress which occurs when wood fibers exceed their tensile capacity consequently leading to breaking, splitting and eventual collapse. Ultimate stress failure may occur instantly under intense roof live loading or heavy snowfall or may occur gradually as long-term creep under dead load weakens the member over time. Together, the three major outcomes that we have considered underscore the fundamental reality that conventionally designed braces must terminate on bearing walls or should be supported on beams that are specifically engineered to carry and distribute roof loads safely to the foundation. Without intentionally designed or code-prescribed supports, the integrity of the roof remains exposed to a constant risk of failure. At this point, the remaining question revolves around how designers can ensure that roof loads are properly supported even when ideal interior bearing walls are absent. 
Cases where interior bearing partitions may not be available include modern open floor architectural layouts and situations where interior walls run perpendicular to the desired line of purlin braces. For these cases, the designer must carefully evaluate alternatives based on the type of brace being used. Purlin braces, for example, are generally installed as multiple members spaced no more than four feet on center. When a bearing wall is not present, one reliable option is to engage a licensed engineer or architect to provide a solution that can adequately support these braces while maintaining the architectural intent. The engineer may introduce cross members to distribute the load evenly across all joists and verify through analysis that the joists have sufficient capacity to support the loads. Additionally, the engineer may specify multi-ply ceiling joists at brace support locations depending on the anticipated loads. Each approach should consider both short-term and long-term effects which ensures that the structural integrity of the roof is preserved and maintained throughout the life of the building. On the other hand, a hip or valley brace is typically a single member which means that the engineer can design a beam to span between exterior bearing walls. One important consideration that an engineer will keep in mind when designing this beam is to limit its deflection to prevent deformation or even cracking in the ceiling finish should the beam deflect more than the ceiling joist. If the beam is too costly, the engineer can also design a site-built truss to support hip and valley rafters. This will be a single truss at the end point of a valley or hip rafter. In this case, a purling brace is not necessary because the reaction from the hip or valley rafter is taken by the truss. The advantage of a site-built truss is that it will use much smaller members as would have been used in framing ceiling joists and rafters. However, the introduction of web members may limit access in the attic. There are possibly many other solutions that the designer and engineer can work out. Any design that satisfies code requirements by preserving structural integrity of the roof and honoring the architectural intent is acceptable. At this point, an experienced designer or framer may raise the objection that they have supported braces on ceiling joists in countless buildings that are still standing without any help or analysis from a licensed engineer or architect. Such a design may have relied on multi-ply ceiling joists or close-by bearing walls to support the ceiling joists. It is possible for a framer or designer who is working without structural analysis to arrive at a design that silently meets the internal demands of structural mechanics and conforms to the allowable code limits of engineered design. However, it takes structural analysis to confirm that the design does not exceed allowable code limits and that all unconventional load path elements have sufficient capacity. Therefore, any brace design that is not directly supported by a bearing partition, as required by code, must be subjected to the rigor of structural analysis under the direction of a licensed civil engineer or architect. If you have designed or framed these types of braces, please leave a comment on your experience. Thanks for watching and if you'd like more training on conventional construction, please check out www.conventionalframing.com. If you found this video helpful, be sure to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more insights into wood framing.